welcome to our DVD meetup in uh, Denver, Boulder, Colorado. Um, by the way, I wanted to mention I, I haven't really done a lot with Twitter uh, over the past three plus years since I've had an account, but I've, I've started to try to do a little bit more with it. So if you want to follow me on Twitter, you might uh, get a little more up-to-date information when it happens. So um, this evening we're going to talk about the second part of uh, the effective aggregate design essay that, <clears throat> that I worked on for the DDD community. And um, as an overview, we're really just going to talk about three main topics this evening. Um, the first one is reference other aggregates by identity. Okay, so uh, basically, um, we'll, we'll get into this more, but basically when an aggregate needs to reference another aggregate, we're recommending as a rule of thumb to reference by identity only. Okay. Uh, secondly, we're going to use talk about using eventual consistency to uh, update aggregates that are outside the boundary of the single aggregate that gets persisted and committed in, in one transaction. So you probably remember from our last discussion a couple months ago <clears throat> that uh, we talked about just modifying and committing changes to a single aggregate at one time uh, in one transaction. So we're going to really look into this evening how to deal with the situation when there are uh, multiple aggregates that need to be updated um, after your primary focus uh, or the, the aggregate of the use case that you're dealing with at the moment is updated. And then finally we'll consider some possible reasons to break the rules of aggregate that we've talked about so far. Um, and there are some times when it, when it makes sense to do that or it may make sense to do it, it may be necessary. So, um, first of all, just as a kind of a review, how many aggregates are there here? Is, is this one entire aggregate because backlog item references product? Does that mean that we have a single aggregate here inside, you know, one boundary? Well, um, if you read the paper, I, I tried to make it clear that, that there are two aggregates. Everything inside this boundary is a single aggregate. Um, the backlog item itself is the aggregate root, and then we have an entity and uh, a collection of value objects that are also inside this boundary. But just because backlog item references product in this case doesn't mean that the product is part of the backlog item aggregate. It is a separate aggregate. It's its own aggregate root. It has its own consistency boundary. And it is outside the boundary of the backlog item aggregate. So the question is, when we have this kind of association, or maybe even just an inferred association from backlog item or any aggregate for that matter over to another aggregate, what happens if the changes to this aggregate um, kind of have a ripple effect and, and there has to be other aggregates, one or more updated that are outside the boundary? Dare we try to modify both aggregates in the same transaction. Well, that breaks the whole idea of the consistency boundary. What we're guaranteeing is that only the things inside this consistency boundary can be updated at any given time. And that's why the boundary is there. That's why we formed that aggregate uh, kind of like a fence or, or a boundary around this aggregate. So that we are guaranteeing that everything inside this boundary can be updated um, in one transaction, but nothing else can. 
So we're going to get into what happens when um, some changes to one aggregate have an effect on others. But for now, let's just keep in mind that these are two distinct aggregates with two separate boundaries. We could draw another boundary around this, but I haven't shown all of the uh, various parts of this product aggregate. So the association that we just looked at there, backlog item to aggregate, is declared in this way. So that is where uh, the backlog item holds a direct object reference, or you might call it a pointer, to product. And this is kind of traditionally the way that um, we usually think about a domain model where we have at least some kind of a graph, or maybe a small graph of, of some kind, where objects can navigate one to another. So inside the backlog item aggregate, we could navigate directly to product. And that's kind of the way we, we look at things. And, and the way that um, Eric defined aggregate uh, association in the blue book. Still, this aggregate is outside backlog item, uh, the backlog item instance boundary. And the point that I'm making is this, this is realized by this code. Okay. Now let's, um, let's review this again, what I just uh, kind of covered a little bit earlier. In a single <coughs> transaction, a command that is uh, operated on this backlog item to make this backlog item dirty within this transaction should not also execute a command that would dirty the product that it points to. That's the simple rule of, of aggregate, single aggregate instance, single transaction. So how do we correct a situation where um, maybe we have a model that we really think we need to access uh, the, the product, maybe make a change to the product from the backlog item? Does it mean that we need to rethink our model? Possibly. It could, it could mean that um, actually product should be the aggregate root and backlog item should be a child entity. Uh, and all the products, backlog items, perhaps should be uh, collected into some kind of a, a set. But remember that in part one, we discussed the problem with that. Um, where does it end? If, if backlog items should be held by product, then why not releases and sprints too? Well, we, we start kind of uh, dominoing into the large cluster aggregate once again by doing this. So even though we may think that we want to modify both of these things in the same transaction, it still might not be the best choice if we want to avoid the large cluster aggregate situation. So instead of backlog item holding a reference to product, what we're emphasizing here as a rule of thumb is for a backlog item to hold uh, actually references to IDs. So backlog item would hold a product ID, a release ID, and a sprint ID. These are the identities that are um, that are the unique, the globally unique identities to the product release and sprint that the backlog item is associated with. Now the backlog item also holds, as it did before, uh, its task entities and estimation log entries. But everything outside its boundary, it's simply holding a, an ID 
to those. Now, some people like the, um, the concept of holding IDs as strings, and you could potentially do that. I like the more explicit use of uh, the actual identity, so this would be, in essence, a copy of the identity that product itself holds, that um, the, the one that release and the one that spring holds as well. Um, there are many reasons for that. For one thing, you're uh, more likely to get the proper ID if you have it um, declared in, in an actual type rather than simply a string. So what are the advantages that we have in this model here? Well, for one thing, when we read in a backlog item, we don't have to worry about product, release, and sprint being read in with it. And even if we were to use lazy loading um, to avoid that, um, still the situation could become um, a little more memory intensive if we needed to use any one of these at any given time. Um, but in general, we're, we could experience better performance from uh, better uh, uh, loading of this aggregate. Um, we wouldn't have as much garbage collection because um, the product, the release, and the spread that hold other their own aggregate parts wouldn't uh, would be affected by the load here. So we might uh, gain quite a bit on faster loading and garbage collection. So a couple of things to think about. Um, and then what we're talking about here is that you notice the difference in the code that, that realizes or implements this, uh, this model here is that we're holding now a product ID rather than the product itself, the first class domain object. So this is, the emphasis is on this new, kind of new rule here, uh, referenced by ID. So, how do we navigate through a model that we just, the model that we just defined there, where we're holding identities instead of direct object references? Remember, before, uh, the backlog item could pretty easily uh, just navigate to the product to ask the product to do something. In this case, we can't do that because all we're holding is an identity. So, um, one concept that has been used is the idea of what's called a disconnected domain model, where a backlog item um, might actually use a team repository, for example, to get to the team that it's associated with. And that's actually a technique I've used before. And some people really like it, and others think it's horrible to do that. Um, but just to be clear, this is not the current DDD consensus view. Um, this, this is really something to be avoided in most cases. Okay. Um, what's being emphasized instead, or recommended instead, is the use of an application service or a domain service to get the uh, reference parts or, or other aggregates um, that are associated. So let's say through an application service, the application service, which is eventually going to execute a command on the backlog item must first resolve um, the, the team by going out to the team repository in behalf of the backlog item, getting that uh, team aggregate, and then assigning the team member to a task by using the backlog item. You're executing that command, passing the resolve team in. And just to note too, this could be uh, a domain service, so perhaps an application service that has a uh, transactional 
uh, boundary or context. It starts a transaction, commits or rolls back. Um, it could delegate to a domain service if that domain service, uh, if, if what needs to be um, uh, gotten on behalf of the backlog item is complex. So if it's not a simple repository uh, finder, uh, but maybe more of a, an elaborate process that needs to be run, maybe some calculations executed beforehand, then um, that may have some more domain logic than we want to put into an application service so we could hand that off or delegate that to a domain service because that's uh, what a domain service is de designed to, to do is deal with uh, stateless domain logic. Um, and then the domain service could then delegate to another aggregate. So those are the, the recommended ways for navigating through the model. Um, grab the dependent parts or associations and then hand them to the application service, or I'm sorry, to the, uh, to the aggregate. Now, one argument that was made recently, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, is that um, you know if, if this aggregate depends on a lot of um, associations, maybe the parameters, passing a number of parameters to this command method could be um, you know, kind of a downside. Maybe you have several parameters uh, to pass in. Well, that's something to think about. Um, I'm not going to go into necessarily a full description of a solution for that. There, there could be several ways of, of um, solving that problem, but um, in the examples that I provide, and specifically in the essay uh, part two, um, I'm only passing actually three parameters to uh, assign team member to task. I pass in the team member ID, the team, and the task ID. So that may not be uh, viewed as, as such a heavy um, method signature that it would be difficult for a client to uh, fulfill that contract. Um, so in our code, uh, the application service could do this. Um, I had to cut off the, the top of this just for room on the slide, but this would be like um, a backlog item application service in bold, let's say, if you like Java and Java kind of de facto naming standards. So we pass in to this uh, application service method a tenant ID, backlog item ID, task ID, and team member ID. So the first step would be to go out to the backlog item repository, instantiate um, a tenant ID from a string. These are all passed in as strings. I don't know how you, uh, again, maybe there would be an advantage in the client of the application service um, having to pass in and resolve the identities here. In this case, I've, I've used uh, strings for passing in the raw ID, which then gets instantiated as um, a tenant ID, a backlog item ID. There are different schools of thought on that. I've chosen this here, but um, if, for example, your presentation tier knows something about domain objects, then it may not be such a bad thing to pass in the actual um, explicit identity types here. Um, after the backlog item is resolved, of course, we need to execute this command, assign team member to task, but we do have to pass in the team. And how do we get the team? Well, we ask the team repository to resolve that entity instance, the team entity, uh, which is an aggregate, by uh, passing the tenant ID and the team ID. We get the team ID from 
the backlog item. And after we resolve the team, uh, we can then invoke assign team member to task, passing in um, the team member ID of a, an explicit type of team and the task ID. So then internally, the backlog item aggregate will fulfill this uh, command and now assign a new team member to um, the task within that backlog item, known as a volunteer. That's the person, that's the team member that's going to handle this uh, task. So, yeah, let's talk about this for a few minutes. Um, I did get into a discussion this past weekend from a uh, um, guy's name is Jürgen Anderson, I think. Hi, Jürgen. If you watch this video, good to meet you. <laughs> um, yeah, he's, he's on the list quite a bit. So, you know, he, he had a question a couple of months ago uh, to the list that said, um, how do I resolve these identities if, you know, if uh, an aggregate references another aggregate by identity, is it okay to <coughs> resolve that by within an aggregate calling out to the repository in order to, get to resolve one or more associations? So first of all, I have to say, I don't think there's anyone who claims that that is um, actually illegal, you know, like if you if you do this, you're breaking uh, some fundamental rule of DDD. Um, because from what I can tell, maybe you know some high percentage, maybe 50, maybe 40 percent of individuals who kind of vote on this approach um, actually do this. So some people feel quite comfortable of using kind of the maybe disconnected domain model approach. And others say, you know, that's something you should completely avoid. It's really a bad practice. So first of all, I just want to say I'm not here by any means trying to say that you shouldn't do this. What I'm trying to make um, clear is that it's not what the consensus view is among DUD experts. And I'll even admit that I got into this discussion specifically with uh, Udi Dahan and Greg Young. And, um, you know, if, if you ever want to have a really interesting, uh, lively technical discussion, get, get into a discussion with those two guys. They'll, uh, they're very convincing. And, you know, I couldn't come up with enough arguments myself personally to prove to them that I thought that uh, that was still a good idea. Um, they came up with plenty of arguments that said that I shouldn't be doing that. And um, I think that discussion, maybe you remember Paul, it took place even that between Udi and, and Eric and Udi and Greg and so forth. Before I ever got to it, I heard it out of the, um, you know, out of another discussion I was in, I wanted to go follow up on that. So later on that day, I followed up on it, and um, I gave several reasons, which I thought were fairly good good reasons for doing that. And so on the list, I've admitted to, to losing that argument. And so um, I wanted to make sure that in the uh, essay that I brought out, the consensus view, which uh, those specific experts say should be followed. So that's one argument. So after having that discussion with uh, Udi and Greg, I, um, I then tried to think through some supporting arguments for why I think this is now the better idea. So I kind of criticized my own viewpoint and these are some of the criticisms that I came up with for this against what you know I did. And, and I'm not saying that I did this on a, uh, a widespread basis, but I have done it in a, 
you know, let's say a few cases in a model. But um, the first argument that I came up with, maybe this makes sense, is um, what about single, the single responsibility principle? If an aggregate essentially involves itself with persistence by going out to a repository to resolve one of its associations, is that, is that aggregate still within uh, the single responsibility that it should be concerned with? Well, before answering that, what I could say is, too, depending on the complexity of the aggregate, I think that you may not really be able to achieve single responsibility um, within an aggregate in some cases. Um, the example that I gave was if a, if a backlog item holds references to tasks, which is our current model, the one that I've presented here, and the backlog item as the root entity, the aggregate root, um, is the only means to access behavior on the task, the backlog item is now very concerned about tasks. And if the interface or the contracts to tasks were to change, the backlog item would have to change. And the backlog item then doesn't have a single reason to change, the reason being to um, change the interface, the implementation of the interface for backlog items. It's now concerned with tasks as well. So some could conclude that that means that with that kind of model, the backlog item itself could not uh, really adhere to closely the single responsibility principle. Others could say, well, you know, that is what a backlog item is supposed to do and therefore it is its single responsibility to do those things and they could argue that it is in fact fulfilling single responsibility principle. Um, I actually don't have a conclusive answer for it. I, I do have my viewpoint and my viewpoint is in that case it would probably um, not qualify as single responsibility principle. In any event, if retrieving, if the way that that dependent object, such as product or team or um, release or sprint, if the way to retrieve that changed, and now the backlog item had to change because of the way that retrieving one of its associations changed, I think that is probably a pretty poor reason to have to change the backlog item. Okay? Because the way that you get to that backlog item or that those dependent objects, those associations changed. Here's another argument that I came up with. Um, Uh, respectfully, Jorgen um, said, well, I don't, I don't want to have uh, so many parameters in my command method. The more parameters I have, the more complex it is to use that. And, and I'll agree with you. I mean, I have seen some methods, even constructors, that take 20 or 25 strings or, or 40 strings um, in order to construct an object. You know, just looking at that, just trying to, as a client, decide, you know, okay, what is my 23rd parameter that I'm going to pass here? It's a string. I don't know what type it is. I mean, chances are very good that those uh, interfaces should have had maybe two or three value objects passed to them, right, instead. But anyway, we've probably all seen code like that. So yeah, definitely. We don't want to see 20, 30, not, maybe not even 10 parameters going into a method. But my argument is, okay, if we're talking two or three arguments, it's probably not that difficult for the client to deal with. And um, so I, I think in this case that um, 
having the number of parameters reduced to just two or three, um, maybe even as many as five or so, it's not so bad. Um, and finally, what if when that aggregate needs to go out and get the product, or, or let's say something more com complicated like it, um, let's not even identify the, the object, but let's just say that coming up with the object that needs to be retrieved, the thing that you're actually after within the aggregate command itself, is really complicated to come up with. And now you may actually even have some <clears throat> uh, private methods within the aggregate that help you solve, you know, or, or resolve that one object that you want to get hold of so that you can do something with it in the command. That, you know, that kind of complexity doesn't probably belong in the aggregate because now the aggregate is trying to solve a problem that's, you know, way outside its responsibilities. And so I think that in this case, um, it's, it's probably not the aggregate's job and that, that level of complexity belongs in, um, in a domain service. Um, yeah, the more heavy processing and so forth, as long as you're deal dealing with a stateless concept, then um, that should go in a domain service. Well, what happens if part of that logic really does belong in the aggregate? Put it in the aggregate. That is the responsibility of the aggregate to perform part of that calculation, but perhaps um, some of that is really, you know, not its responsibility at all. So we could split the domain logic in two. Part of it belongs in a domain service, and once the domain service resolves that one nugget of uh, information and possibly behavior that is needed by the aggregate instance, then delegate to the aggregate and have that, that second part of the domain logic housed in the aggregate. All right. So I hope that wasn't too long-winded, and I certainly say everything that I said with respect, and I, um, you know, just, just uh, know that I was um, also corrected in this area too, let's say, so I, I in no way try to hold, you know, an upper hand or anything like that. I, I appreciate very much the opportunity to learn from guys like Udi and Greg, who are, um, you know, really uh, themselves at the forefront of DDD these days, along with Eric and, and some others. So <clears throat> I say all those things very respectfully. Um, so an advantage that we do gain from, from reference by identity rather than reference by uh, object, direct object, pointer or association is that we, we get this uh, scalability and distribution advantage because now we have the option for our persistence to be dealt with in a completely different way than, than most of us have used for years, let's say in, uh, in an object relational situation where we're, where we're persisting to a relational database. Um, so think of this as not separate stores, but simply uh, separate, separate nodes within a storage concept. So think of this as, a, as some kind of a document store, a key value store, <clears throat> a NoSQL store, if you will. It doesn't mean that every NoSQL store um, kind of qualifies for this kind of distributed scalability, but without naming uh, various products that do or don't fit this, just imagine um, conceptually a, uh, um, a persistence mechanism that allows you to add nodes in at will and scale this storage out further. 
the advantage that we have here is if, if we're only using unique identities um, to store, and if the, the aggregate instances themselves only hold uh, the unique identities um, of, of objects that they're associated to, then these various aggregates that are represented by these unique IDs, there's a lot more data here with them, but um, these guys can now be repartitioned continuously. Um, and that is what Pat Helland of Amazon.com emphasizes in this paper, Life Beyond Distributed Transactions. So um, I believe uh, Pat Helland in, in his paper said that he used to be you know, like this um, <clears throat> global transaction um, uh, adherent, I guess. I, I don't, you know, want to put a label on, on his role with global transactions, but he finally realized that for, uh, and maybe with the rest of his team at Amazon, that if they were going to get the scalability that they needed, they could not use global transactions anymore. They had to go away from it. So I, I invite you to read this paper. Um, it's been referenced by Greg Young uh, several times on the uh, Yahoo group DDD list. And uh, so I reference it here in, or in the paper. So what's accomplished now? Let's say we're going to add one node in um, with continuous repartitioning. The aggregate or any number of aggregates that were previously stored here could be now repartitioned to another node. It doesn't matter now if we go get this, this aggregate Let's say that this aggregate has association references by identity to other aggregates in a completely different uh, storage node. Let's say it's this one. And we go back to that use case where we're assigning, for example, uh, a team member to a task. And that application service is resolving the reference um, uh, to the team, wherever that repository needs to go is, is not of any concern to the upper layers. Rather, it's, it's only of concern to this distributed persistence mechanism. And it knows where to go find this ID. If this were the ID for the team, it, it goes to this node and, and grabs it. And actually, if you have a really well implemented distributed um, storage mechanism, if this node were to completely go down, this aggregate instance would still be available on one of these other nodes. So that's, um, that's the advantage, or at least one a huge advantage that we have in, in being able to um, use, you know, kind of like cloud technologies. Sometimes we don't always know what that means, but I think in this case it's, it's proven that uh, that some storage mechanisms, like Reoc, um, uh, that is inspired by Amazon Dynamo, um, can support this distributed uh, persistence mechanism. Very powerful. All right, so that kind of closes out the first section of the discussion. So now, if we were to go back to that concept of the backlog item has its own consistency boundary, it holds tasks, and it holds estimation log entries, or the, the tasks themselves hold that association. Um, but if something else that backlog item holds a reference to needs to be updated. How do we do that? It's not going to happen. If we're following the rules of aggregate, it's not going to happen in the same transaction that backlog item is updated. So let me give you an example. I think we talked about that, this uh, specific example in the first um, 
um, the presentation on the first part a couple months ago. Um, so we need to commit the backlog item to a sprint. So we have a command on backlog item named commit to, and it takes as a single argument a sprint. Well, the domain logic within commit to gets carried out, and one of the things that happens is the backlog item retains not a reference to the sprint itself, but just a reference to the identity. Okay. But now, the sprint also has to know that the backlog item was committed to it. And um, as I'll, I'll show in, in a not too distant slide, maybe even the next one here, um, we're, we're not just keeping a bidirectional association for the sake of holding a bidirectional association. There's real purpose to the sprint knowing about all its backlog items and the backlog items uh, know, knowing what sprint they belong to. It's a very important purpose behind that. So how do we solve that problem? And again, I think as I, as I quoted uh, the last time in part one presentation, there's, there's an often overlooked detail within the aggregate pattern in the blue book on page 128 that states this. Um, any rule that spans aggregates will not be expected to be up to date at all times. Well, that, that leaves it a little open, right? Maybe sometimes it will, but for the most part, for the most part, I think, and again, this is my interpretation, I'm not trying to speak for anyone else, for the most part, it's, all, it, it's usually through event processing, batch processing, or some kind of other update mechanisms that other dependencies can be resolved within some specific time. So what that means is we need a, some way of communicating that this backlog item that's been updated, it now has a notion of the sprint that it is committed to. We need some way to inform the sprint or something else that the sprint needs to know about this newly committed backlog item. right? So that's what's in question right now. And so how do we go about doing that? Well, within this backlog item aggregate, we have a commit to, this commit to command method. It uh, takes as its argument a sprint, and then all this domain logic is carried out right here. Within this ellipsis, all that wonderful stuff happens where um, we know that we can actually do this properly, and we make a reference to the sprint through the sprint ID. The last thing that we do is we publish a domain event, the backlog item committed domain event. Here we're going to make sure we pass the tenant ID because the tenant ID um, says that this uh, operation occurred specifically within the uh, this tenant. We don't want to mix it up with any other tenants in our software as a service platform. We pass the backlog item ID of the backlog, this itself, that was committed to the sprint, and we pass the sprint ID to the constructor of this backlog item committed event, and it's published. The idea here is that eventually Sprint will know, be made aware of the fact that this backlog item was committed to it. So how does that happen? So I'm going to step through some event uh, processing here. Um, Paul recommended that I try to come up with a, with a diagram to this because it is a, a little bit, you know, complicated to think about sometimes. So, Paul, here's the diagram. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, 
so the backlog item publish occurs. This again is a um, is an object diagram in UML, so it's showing instances of objects. Okay, this is an instance of a backlog item. And for space, I haven't shown the class names here, but it's pretty obvious what classes they're from. And this is a domain event publisher that is receiving a publish event, and it takes as its argument a uh, backlog item committed event instance. Okay. And then some stuff happens, which I'm not going to go into, but um, there are various parts of infrastructure that have to uh, be in control of, of this. So the, this, this publisher here is a lightweight publisher. It's just like a gang of four observer pattern or you know, publish subscribe. There's no real you know, complexity within this. But what actually receives the uh, handle event notification from this does something with it like you know eventually it, it's put onto a real queue of some kind or um, pub sub uh, channel and um, and so that that infrastructure ends up you know um, putting that that event on a queue so now it could go it could get broadcast um, published throughout the enterprise, or perhaps just just broadcast internally to this model. Okay, in this case, we're only concerned with this model. Um, so eventually, we want the sprint to be updated. What happens next? Well, so it, it goes from this queue, some backlog item committed handler, an instance receives a handle. Uh, Invocation, passing at the the uh, the event instance, and so now this handler is ready to go into action and, and make sure that the sprint is given uh, what it needs to be aware of the backlog item that's been committed to it previously. But how does this how does it do that? What are the parts that it needs? First of all. Event. Well, it's, it's got the event. The event is passed in the handle. Good. Well, remember the IDs that were passed? The tenant ID, the backlog item ID, and the sprint ID. So it doesn't have the backlog item and it doesn't have the sprint. Yeah. Right? So it's going to have to resolve those. So, uh, what? Wrong direction. So the backlog item uh, committed handler goes out to the backlog item repository, right? Does some kind of a find, um, gets the backlog item. Next, it goes out to the sprint repository, does a find, gets the sprint instance, and then it invokes on sprint commit, passing the backlog item that found here. And what does the sprint do? The sprint creates a new committed backlog item. This is a separate concept. It's not, it's not the same as a backlog item. It is a committed backlog item. And the sprint holds a collection, a set of committed backlog items. Now, th this separation is important. We're going we're gonna to get to that in a moment. Why, why does a backlog item and a committed backlog item have to exist. Why can't the sprint simply hold a reference to the backlog item? Well, in another model, maybe someone could, could make that work. Uh, the example that I have here has a committed backlog item as a separate concept for, for a very specific reason. First of all, is this clear? And understand, this occurs um, synchronously. This is in the same thread as the backlog item, this publish. And any uh, notification to listeners before this infrastructure happens in the same thread. So there's no mystery here. But from here forward, this is asynchronous. So 
you know, just, just have it clear in your mind. When this guy commits, when it now has a notion of its sprint ID and other states that are very concerned with, um, with the, the backlog uh, item itself, this sprint does not commit in that same transaction. It happens later. It could be just some milliseconds later, but it happens later. So, uh, notice here that actually products hold any number of product backlog items. Sprints hold committed backlog items, any number of them. Releases hold scheduled backlog items. And backlog items hold their business priority. Actually, that's wrong. Scratch that. <laughs> There's only one business priority per um, per backlog item. I guess I got a little happy with the multiplicity there. <laughs> um, but notice something in common with these three associations. They all have an ordering attribute. And uh, this ordering attribute, this ordering attribute, and this ordering attribute are all different. Because um, the ordering that a backlog item can have in a release can have a completely different um, value than it does in a sprint and in the product. So maybe the product owner likes to sort by the ordering attribute in one way within the product and then the team that's concerned with the sprint is maybe ordering that differently and uh, the scheduled backlog item within the release is ordered completely differently. And that's all separate from the backlog item that has a business priority that's not based on an ordering, it's based on some other metrics of complexity and risk and things like that, all right? So, and by the way, this, this used to be, I guess, more, uh, maybe better known by priority, but recently in, uh, Scrum has, has renamed that concept because it's not necessarily a priority, it's just an ordering. It, it doesn't necessarily mean priority. It just is a way of, of organizing and uh, sequencing backlog items. Okay. So that's, again, I guess to, maybe I got off uh, base here a little bit, but to, um, to make the point, this sprint needs to hold a committed backlog item because of um, the ordering could be completely different. Okay. Then the ordering is in other So, how do we know that we should use eventual consistency instead of transactional consistency or immediate consistency? Why, what choice do we make? And um, actually, you know, I don't know that I always have like a good answer to that myself because it's, it is a complicated question to answer. And um, so I was, talking to Eric Evans about this um, as I was writing the essay and he was giving me a lot of good ideas to think about <clears throat> and um, he said well what I do is I ask whose job it is is it so think about a user a use case or a user story all right um, let's just say a use case goal needs to be accomplished and so we execute some uh, flow in a use case and the user that's executing, executing that flow has a specific job. They have a user goal to complete. But they have some things that the system 
or some other user may do that, that they're not responsible for in that use case. So the main question here to distinguish between do we use immediate or eventual consistency is, is it the user's job, the user who is currently executing that use case flow, to make sure that that new state on an aggregate, a single aggregate within a single boundary, must that be transactionally consistent right now when the user goal completes? If, it, if that is the case, then we want to make sure that, we, um, that it is transactionally consistent. All right? However, um, if it is not that user's part of that user's goal to um, to complete completely carry out consistency of some other data items, then you would tend to use eventual consistency. So we'll elaborate on that just a little bit in a moment, but. Um, the point here is that, depending on your, your kind of like world view, um, classic or traditional DDD practitioners may prefer uh, transactional consistency. Maybe if you're more of a CQRS, kind of like do a lot of uh, messaging, maybe you use a message bus or something like that. Um, you might be more comfortable with eventual consistency and you might just lean one way or the other based on your world view or your, or your experience that you're used to. Um, but again, I, th I think you know, these are technical leading, leanings and that's kind of the point I was uh, bringing up is that to me there's no real clear answer on which way you should go with this. So, follow this advice, ask whose job it is. So again, if it's the job of the user executing the use case, try to use transactional consistency, and if it's the job of another user or job of the system, then eventual consistency makes sense. Well, let's, let's go back to our example of um, committing a backlog item to a sprint. Well, some user has as a user goal to commit this backlog item to a sprint. So it executes, you know, fills out some information on, a, on the UI, um, clicks a button, um, eventually we get to uh, our application service method to commit this. We grab all the parts that we need, the, the, the sprint and the backlog item, and we execute the command backlog item dot commit to a sprint. All right? So it is definitely that user's job to make sure that the backlog item knows that it is committed. But we could um, conclude that it's not also that user's job to make sure that the sprint knows that a backlog item was com uh, committed to it. In fact, since that user isn't necessarily directly dealing with um, the sprint order list, maybe it's, you know, they aren't even going to see if that, if that list were to be updated immediately. The UI could be completely different. They, they aren't looking at that. So let's just say that it's not the user's job to make sure that the sprint knows about the newly committed backlog item, but it is their job to, know, to make sure that the backlog item uh, knows that it's committed to the sprint. So then we would conclude that, on the other hand, it is the system's job to make sure that the sprint knows that the backlog item is committed to it. And that's what we're talking about here. So as, as teams, if we can kind of discuss um, these two cases of transactional or eventual consistency in terms of whose job is it, then 
uh, can help us kind of break the tie, come up with a domain-specific solution to this, uh, the answer to that question rather than just a technical preference. So reasons to break the rules. So we're going to just briefly touch on, on this. Um, I actually don't know necessarily what, what other folks think about this. Uh, these are, are mostly like experiences that, that I've had. So there may be other reasons to, um, to break the rules. I, you know, I'd like to know if anyone else has any other experience along these lines. But um, for example, one of them that I, that I cite in the essay is user interface convenience. So is it convenient um, for the user interface to allow the, the user to fill out any number of, of data elements in a, let's say like in a grid type of, of UI or something like that where you have all these common uh, attributes, everything's common on, on uh, certain instances of, of aggregates but there may be just a few things that are unique. So what do we do? Well, we, we fill out the really common stuff in, in kind of just a flat form UI and then click next, maybe in a wizard or something like that. And, and the next thing that we get is um, a, a table with all those common elements already filled out. But now we can fill out some specific information about each of those and, and that kind of expedites the, the user getting to their end goal of, of getting these new things created. Well, if we're talking about the creation of new aggregate instances, chances are good in many cases that you could commit the creation of, or in essence, the insertion of new aggregate objects into, per, into the persistent store, whatever that mechanism is, we can probably commit all those things without causing some kind of a cons consistency um, error, okay? Because they're just brand new objects and probably, you know, in a lot of cases, the attributes won't be referencing something that's going to cause a business rule to break, some kind of invariant to break. So. Um, I think in, in some cases it may be just fine to have a UI that, that allows a lot of data to be filled out all at once for creational purposes and submit that and allow several aggregates to be created at one time. No transaction issues. But you'll have to determine could there be transaction issues. If, if there could be, you don't want to do that, obviously. Um, Another one is lack of technical mechanisms. What, what would you do if you entered a project and uh, your team lead said, you know what, I think that messaging is too complex. <laughs> well, some of us may laugh at that, but it happens, okay? Um, yeah. We're not going to use any kind of messaging mechanism because it's too complex. So we're going to have to figure out another way to notify objects that they need to be updated. Oh, we could still use that that um, that domain event publisher, but because we're not going to delegate the the uh, publication of, or the notification of domain events to maybe multiple listeners asynchronously, they're all going to happen synchronously. If we were to try to use that mechanism um, to get other instances of aggregates updated, that's all going to happen in the same thread, same transaction, right? So that's really not necessarily an answer. So what do you do? Well. You could just take the chance and say, um, I think that, that you have to do this. Um, I, I think you have to update you know, all these aggregate instances in a, 
in a single transaction? Well, we already discussed in part one that that can easily lead to transactional failures, right? Um, concurrency uh, problems can exist from that. So even if we were to try to model our large cluster aggregate back into place to take care of that, we still haven't uh, necessarily solved. We, we may be modifying that single aggregate because now we have this large cluster and by definition it's in a single aggregate. So yeah, we're, we are only modifying one aggregate per transaction. Okay? We're playing by the rules, but we already talked about the problems doing that. So, um, what else could we do? Well, we keep the, the aggregates broken apart. We're just going to try to persist all of them in a single transaction. But that's, that's, you know, semantically the same as having a large cluster aggregate. I mean, it, it may solve some performance issues, some memory load and stuff like that, because we're getting less objects in memory at a time. But we'll still probably run into the concurrency issues that we discussed. Well, there may not be a good answer for this in all cases. Maybe, maybe eventually your, your team lead is going to go, oh, I see. Yeah, well, maybe a messaging mechanism isn't that complex after all. Or they could say, uh, well, we have to find another way to solve this problem. What do we do? Well, I think um, one good reason to break the rule when that is the case is if you have what I kind of refer to as user aggregate, um, wow, I just, uh, affinity, sorry. The word left my mind for a minute there. User aggregate affinity, which basically means that a single user will tend to use these aggregate instances at any given point in time. And quite likely, no other user of the system will at that point in time be using the same aggregates. Some domains that works out well. You can imagine um, a user that is focused on a specific kind of uh, use case that involves just a, a concentrated effort on, on one thing, maybe one physical thing, but it's represented by multiple aggregate instances in our model. So the user is perhaps interacting with this one physical thing, and as they're making note of um, uh, things that are happening with this one physical thing, it, through the user interface, they have a user aggregate affinity with this group of aggregate instances, and no one else around them or, or throughout the globe are focused on that one physical thing at that time. And so if they commit changes to multiple instances of different aggregates in a single transaction, that will in most cases work because you won't have a concurrency conflict with any other user. All right? So if you have user aggregate affinity it makes it safer to do that. Which also means that potentially, if you have a situation like that, you may want to think about modeling aggregates so that they are, uh, th that they do have an affinity to a single user, if you're facing that case. It could help you to, to kind of rethink the model a little bit and say, well, if we, if we model it this way, these two or more users could collide. Whereas, if we model it this way, will tend to have only one user hitting that at any given time. Okay? Now, the third point here is in a, in a very um, well-established enterprise, um, global transactions are just, you know, something that, that, have, that has to be dealt with. Dealt with. <clears throat> um, I mean, I'm, I'm working on a project right now that has cross-schema foreign key relationships, 
and it it makes it makes it a real challenge to you know deal with the domain. So you know global transactions um, are also you know something that that's quite common and. Uh, you know, XA or two-phase commit, you know, is just in use in a lot of places. If you run into this situation where you have to, yes, commit a transaction um, in your own local model, but these other models over here that are distributed and, and, and not part of your actual data source, or persistence mechanism, then a global transaction has to be used to make sure that these other uh, objects are are held in sync globally. So, in essence, uh, logically speaking, they are all committed within a single transaction. What do you do? What you do is you do whatever governance says you do, right? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, whatever the policies are, that's what we live with. We can try to, we can try to talk ourselves out of that situation, and then sometimes that works, and sometimes it doesn't. So we just simply do what um, what the enterprise policy says we'll do. But one thing to think about is, even though you may have to use a global transaction because of your uh, relationship to other models, other systems, it doesn't mean that you necessarily have to commit uh, multiple aggregate instance changes to multiple aggregate, aggregate instances in your own transaction. So you still have your data source and even though you're in an XA or two-phase commit transaction, um, it doesn't mean that you have to update multiple instances in a single in your own transaction, but or the part of the global transaction that belongs to you. Uh, so, so you can still obey the rules of aggregate in your own model. So just the thought that even though a global transaction may be absolutely necessary, it doesn't mean that you have to adhere to it yourself. Now the problem with global transaction, as uh, Pat Helen points out, is that um, you're just never going to scale the way that you could with uh, the event-driven architecture that, that comes with um, distributed persistence mechanisms and, and messaging systems that, that usually are used along with those. But you can still um, make the best of a challenging situation, let's say. And finally, uh, point number four here is query performance is important. Um, in, in a lot of cases, um, let's say that we actually do have to go out to more than one or two repositories and, and uh, find aggregate instances. And it just takes you know, quite a long time. It's quite a, an expensive part of the task to go out and grab, you know, from different places these these uh, various aggregate instances, what do you do? Well, if you have the advantage to use um, database joins, let's say, and you can scoop up a bunch of the data in one fell swoop and, and, and basically get several aggregates in one uh, trip to the database, that would be advantageous. And, and a lot of times when we're using um, uh, let's say like object relational mapping, Hibernate or Toplink or, or something like that, we can have those um, those optimal queries run for us and we can get a bunch of uh, uh, data for various aggregates at one time. So um, as far as the uh, query performance goes, if we're running up against a problem with getting all the the aggregate instances that we need to execute a specific use case flow, then um, we may have to make a trade-off and say, well, in this particular case, I'm going to reference 
these aggregates not by identity but by pointer or direct object reference. And so we, we can eagerly load those, uh, allow the, the sophisticated um, persistence queries to, to take place and, and help us um, resolve those more optimally. So those, those are four areas that I came up with for potential reasons to break the rules. Um, perhaps you've got some other reasons that, that come to mind. But uh, one thing that we want to emphasize is we only break the rules for good reason. The, the, you know, like uh, you know, stay between the lines. The lines are our friends. Right? So we're, we're trying to um, adhere to these where possible, or, or not even where possible, but um, uh, in, in all cases, but the very few where we have very good reason to break the rule. We don't go looking for reasons to break the rules. Um, you know, I guess we can always do the mental gymnastics and talk ourselves into, uh, yeah, well, this is a really good reason to break the rule because we're a little bit lazy or something like that, but um, we want to only find good reasons, really good reasons. So the benefits to adhering to the rules, again, emphasizing that we're going to have uh, consistency of invariance within a single aggregate instance. This is the key to using aggregate in the first place. So consistency where necessary, because we do have a real business rule that specifies this must be consistent in this case. Okay. And we're going to have optimally performing and highly scalable domains if we stick to the to the rules that have been advocated in part one and part two of the essay um, effective aggregate design. Now, in part three, what's uh, coming up is this team that was a little, at one point, less familiar with with some of these rules of thumb from DDD. They're now more familiar from with them. They've they've learned some. Uh, hard lessons, right? And now they're going to use their newfound techniques and take a walk through their model and, and see, you know, like, could we improve this even more? Okay, now we're now we're committed to making sure that we have aggregate boundaries around specific um, model elements that that must remain consistent at all times. Um, we're going to reference other aggregates by identity only. We're going to use eventual consistency to our advantage to make sure that other parts of the model are up to date at some point in time that's practical, that will not cause problems for the business. And uh, so we're going, to, we're going to embrace those ideas, those rules, now is it possible that what we've modeled so far could be vastly improved or, or even just incrementally improved? Just small improvements. Could we make some small improvements by, by walking through our model and seeing if we can apply those now? That, that's the discussion of in part three. And uh, I think it's called something like um, the modeling discovery process or something like that. Um, forget the title, right, the subtitle right now, but that should be coming up soon, um, hopefully within you know, a short period of time from now. So, um, again, I just want to acknowledge here that Eric uh, put together the, the um, DVD Summit 2011, and it was quite a unique opportunity, and um, you know, sometimes I can't even believe I was allowed to be there, but anyway, I was. And, uh, um, you know, Martin Fowler was there, which kind of adds a lot of credence to, to the event. And uh, Randy Stafford, who um, had one of the, the earliest posts to uh, the DDD Yahoo group, you know, like, like post number 70-something. <laughs> So he's been with DDD for quite a long time. Uh, Paul here, who teaches for Eric, um, 
and I highly recommend that anybody who would like to attend Eric's DVD immersion class fly out to Denver and if you come in the winter uh, you can ski get great instruction from Paul um, no, not ski instruction no not ski instruction <laughs> DVD instruction but uh, then you could ski before or after the class and I've offered to um, go up skiing with anybody who'd like to, to go to that. And I'm, I know that a lot of you here have already attended the DVD immersion class, so the message isn't for you, but if this does make it to the internet, um, I'm giving a nice plug for the DVD immersion, which I attended just a little over a year ago. It was awesome. Um, and if you, if you come in the spring or summer, mountain biking and stuff like that, hiking, backpacking is available here in colorful Colorado. Uh, of course, Udi the Han, um, you know, if, uh, if you get an opportunity to, to meet Udi and attend one of his classes on uh, SOA or distributed systems, I'm, I'm certain that that would be a rare opportunity for you. Um, Alberto Brandolini, my friend in Italy, our friend, he teaches uh, some of the DDD immersion classes and other courses in Europe. He's uh, a DDD practitioner in Italy. And Greg Young, of course, who, if you keep up with his tweets, he's a world traveler, always going everywhere and constantly busy, um, and uh, has quite a bit to do with CQRS and event sourcing. And of course, Udi is uh, another, uh, or one of the main CQRS proponents, Jimmy Nielsen, who uh, had one of the early DVD books, um, and Nicholas Hedman, a uh, Swedish guy who works with, uh, from afar, with uh, uh, Ricard Oberg on uh, Chief for J, and he also is a, a DVD guy, and finally me. So, and then, of course, the, the reviews I got from several of the, the summit um, attendees, and, and mostly from Eric and Paul, uh, kind of correcting all my all my uh, mistakes. So, anyway, much thanks and acknowledgement to everyone there. And uh, again, if if you'd like to contact me, please feel free to reach me by email or follow me on Twitter, and I'll try to keep you up to date on the next. Uh, the final part of this essay release and any other news that's perhaps worth sharing. All right. Thank you very much.